Hello and welcome to this educational meeting this evening linked to improving care in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So answering the call, practical strategies for improving earlier diagnosis and patient-centered management in primary care. Tonight, we're gonna to be covering pharmacological treatments of COPD in the primary care setting. And this is in links with the International Primary Care Respiratory Group, the COPD Foundation and Integrity Continuing Education. Um, my name is Steve Holmes. I'm a general practitioner, a family physician back in the UK and have a number of educational um, inputs there and national work on guidelines and other work. And I'm joined um, with my colleague today, Helgo from uh, Germany. Helgo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, my name is Helgo Magnus and I'm a professor of medicine and I'm working in the northern part of Germany. I was a former director of the Lung Clinic in Großhansdorf, which is close to Hamburg. And I'm the founder of the Pulmonary Research Institute at the Lung Clinic. And presently I'm working in a group of a lot of different doctors in Hamburg downtown. Great to have you with us this evening, and it should be a great collaborative between family physicians and more specialised colleagues, and hopefully we will be able to inspire you to make a difference to people who have COPD and really make an impact on their care. And part of this is going to be really tonight about individualising pharmacological treatment based on their COPD severity, their risk of exacerbations, and of course, what's absolutely vital when we think about inhalers it's not like just popping a pill in it's about being able to use a specific inhaler appropriately to get the medicine in when when we prescribe it so there's there's a need for us to be quite careful about the choice of inhaler so let's think a little bit i'm going to start presenting then Helgo's going to take over and then we'll have time for discussion at the end but it's worthwhile just thinking about COPD in terms of other diseases like heart disease, like musculoskeletal problems, rheumatoid arthritis. Part of our treatment is around reducing symptoms, helping the patient to minimize the impact it has on their life, relieving those symptoms, helping them to get out and do more and helping them to feel better in themselves as well as reducing the risk. Now in heart disease, that's gonna be your heart attacks, heart failure, other problems in that zone. In rheumatoid arthritis, we're trying to prevent the aggressive progression of the disease. And in COPD, we're trying to prevent disease progression and we're trying to prevent and effectively treat exacerbations and hence reduce more mortality. So again, that two-pronged tack is now a fundamental core part of our care in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And we're going to specifically look at dual bronchodilation in more detail because that's one of the newer therapies around. But it's really important to remember that managing COPD is not just about a prescription. It is about understanding our patients, making a fundamentally a good, accurate diagnosis. And then there are the non-pharmacological interventions. We should be thinking about tobacco dependency. We should be thinking about immunizations, pneumococcal influenza vaccinations. Uh, there are other vaccinations coming through. You might just want to think which one is most likely, uh, perhaps something we've been working together globally on for the last two years. But fundamentally with COPD, we've also got to be thinking about pulmonary rehabilitation, really good evidence base behind that. We need to be thinking about working with our patients to develop a self-management plan and also as many of us are aware in, in family medicine, a lot of these patients don't just have a pair of lungs, they have um, hearts. A lot of these people have heart disease. A lot of these people maybe have problems with osteoporosis linked to smoking, lack of activity, sometimes high dose inhaled corticosteroids or prolonged or cor corticosteroid courses. So there's a variety of other comorbidities that are fundamental to, to the care of our patients. And another in our series I would commend you to is on May the 3rd, there will be a session run by uh, my colleagues, Sally Singh and Claire Cook, who are both really expert in pulmonary rehabilitation rehabilitation and also in these fundamentals that we all need to get right to provide that care that we need. But Helgo and myself are going to be concentrating more tonight on the work around inhaled therapies and how we should progress with that. And I guess moving on, before we step straight into inhaled therapies, it's worthwhile thinking if we are talking pharmacologically that there are other 
areas that might make a difference here in terms of pharmacology. Tobacco dependency. We all know how important it is to help our patients to stop smoking. Most of us now are trained to give very brief advice, a brief intervention that we have an evidence base behind that will make smoking cessation more likely with our patients. And when we do intervene, we know that the best way to help someone to stop is with one of the pharmacological methods we have available, nicotine replacement therapy, varinicline, bupropion, cysticine, or, and that needs to be in combination with a supportive professional help to get them through their smoking. The best way, even if they fail before, with smoking cessation. So we shouldn't forget some of the other therapeutic agencies we have, we've got outside. I, I mentioned earlier about immunization and you'll see SARS-CoV-2 in there. It's very likely, I think, both in the American guidance and WHO, that we will be needing to reboost patients, at least in the foreseeable future. And don't forget pertussis. Um, certainly seems to circulate in the adult population on about a three yearly cycle. And people who get pertussis often have quite a protracted cough if they develop that in adulthood. I think the in China, they used to call it the 100 day cough, three months or more. And certainly some research has shown that the cough and that persisting disability can often last longer than three months. So let's get those basics right. But let's start thinking about the, the inhaled therapies and the first thing I just wanted to do to move us into the zone where Helgo is going to take over is help us to think about combined labor lama therapy compared to using a labor or a lama alone. So long acting beta agonist, labor, long acting muscarinic antagonist, uh, lama. Combination therapies we're fully aware of now, and we'll touch on those in a moment, but we're also aware of those as a single therapy. And often over time, these have been changing. And today we're gonna to be specifically looking at people with more moderate to severe COPD, but actually what we want with all our patients is to be as active as, as possible to promote activity. And what we know with the Labalama therapies in summary is they are effective at improving lung function, they are effective at helping to reduce symptoms, to help to prevent disease deterioration to an extent, and to reduce the risk of exacerbations. And in quite a lot of studies, an exacerbation, if you're admitted to a hospital setting with an exacerbation, you are more likely to die within the next three months than if you're admitted to hospital with a myocardial infarction. So these events that patients have are not straightforward, simple areas. And there's a variety of systematic reviews, Cochrane reviews and national guidances that have really comprehensively looked at the data and come up with convincingly similar advice on that. So we will touch on a couple of the trials, but remember there's a really solid basis behind that. The second thing is, and, and know this, if you've been in clinical practice for a while and using the inhaled therapies, it's surprisingly uncommon for dual bronchiolitis dilation to have any significant safety concerns and certainly it seems to be very similar to those on monobronchodilation. So as we move on, wow, what an incredible number of inhaled therapies we have for, for people like myself who are getting a little bit older now, we can probably remember where there were only three or four available. I looked in the UK at the moment, there are 139 different inhaler preparations with about 28 different inhaler devices available. And those cover short acting beta agonists, short acting muscarinic antagonists, um, and short acting combination of a beta agonist with a long acting muscarinic. Now the short acting ones to me are a bit like driving your car. If you're gonna be driving all day, I don't want to fill up with petrol three or four times a day. I want to do that just once a day. And to me, if I really want my patients to be active, I'm thinking, let's keep them so they don't have to keep going back and resorting to medication, but they can get through the day. And that's probably where these long acting medications come in. The long acting beta agonists, of which there are several around, the long acting muscarinic antagonists, and more recently, the, the combinations of the two, the LABA, LAMA. Let's not forget with COPD, we've got something that we've used for a long period of time, the long-acting beta agonist and inhaled corticosteroid option as well. 
And that isn't something that we should just say, okay, now we're into a new era, let's forget about what we've used before. There will be situations where we need that therapy. And of course, let's bang them all together and use a triple therapy, a long acting betragonist, long acting muscarinic, and an inhaled corticosteroid together. And more and more of these are becoming available and will be coming available over the next couple of uh, years. So we're in a, quite a good position options wise to think about where we should be going. But if we think purely about the um, LABA, LAMA, that combination bronchodilation, some people call it that maximal bronchodilation, what we're seeing is it does prevent these exacerbations and it can help to, prove, to improve lung function over single therapy on its own. I think that's probably what we would imagine would happen if we, if we combine things together. Equally so, we would imagine that actually improving bronchodilation would allow the patient to be more um, be able to take more exercise and do better in terms of things like the um, CAT score, the, as well as probably exacerbations to an extent, although um, that sometimes hasn't been quite as strong in the, some of the earlier evidence. What's been happening over time is we have looked more and more about this though, and what we are finding in many, many of these trials, again, summated into things like Cochrane Reviews and summated into our national guidances around the world, is that impact on trying to reduce the terrible burden of problems that occur with our patients with COPD. And probably I just want to, before we move on, to remind you of a couple of things around COPD. What we know is that deterioration in lung function does occur after the exacerbations. We also know from more recent research that there is a drop in the amount of lung function that drop, that is greater in people with milder COPD than in more severe COPD, but the ones with severe COPD can't afford to lose that. And so we're now at this stage, and I'll just touch on this before I hand over, of thinking about that pharmacological management, stable COPD, what can we do? This is taken from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. There are lots of other good guidelines around, but it probably makes it easy sense. The first half su suggesting if the person does not have asthma features, that we maximally bronchodilate if they don't get rid of, um, better with sh a, a short acting reliever. So that's LIBA and LAMA. And that's, um, certainly in the UK is because of a cost economic evaluation that suggests better bronchodilation, better quality of life, better bronchodilation and LABA LAMA together, a, a greater reduction in exacerbations. If our patient is still exacerbating, we then consider triple therapy of all three of the um, preparations, LABA LAMA and ICS. And if the person has symptoms in NICE, they suggest a three month trial of triple therapy. And if that doesn't work, just go back to the LABA LAMA. On the opposite half of that slide, what you'll see is people with asthmatic features, and this may be something we want to debate later, but asthmatic features are somebody probably under the age of 40 who's definitely had asthma, or somebody who has quite significant variability, perhaps 20% on peak flow or three, 400 mils on an FEV1 if we're measuring their lung function. Or they have a high eosinophil count when they're not being treated. And by high, that is 0.3 or 300 in, in, in the different units around. Um, in some areas, that figure has been thought of as being slightly lower. In others, it's been considered slightly higher. But look at the eosinophil count. See if there's a, likely to be an eosinophilic inflammation suggesting asthma. In that group, remember the core treatment for asthma is an inhaled corticosteroid. And that doesn't differ if they have asthma with COPD in combination. So that's where we go on to your LABA ICS. In terms of gold, the gold strategy, um, updated every year, again, a little bit complex. They, they tried to make it more complex, but you might think of it fairly straightforwardly. In group C, someone who exacerbates a lot and doesn't have a great deal of symptoms, they should be on a LAMA. And I would argue they should be taking more exercise, so they probably move to group D because they should have symptoms. We want them to be exercising and developing and improving their general condition. In group D, they suggest a LAMA first, unless you're thinking more about LAMA-LABA or potentially someone with asthma. 
in group A, they talk about bronchodilators, but as bronchodilators, they quite rightly suggest a bronchodilator, short acting beta agonists help a bit for a short period of time, but the LAMA is the one that improves symptoms and reduces exacerbations. The LABA alone suggested potentially in group B only helps with symptom improvement. And so probably gold at a global level, depending on the cost economics in your country, may be suggesting primarily use of a LAMA if, you, if patients can get hold of that. Although again, in the um, American guidance and the UK guidance and many of those around Europe where availability of uh, medications more easy, we're probably trying to bronchodilate more significantly with a LAMA LABA. Next stage, following up, again, quite straightforward really when we think that through, we should be reviewing our patients to make sure we've got improvement as was shown on the previous slide that Nice suggested, this is the one from Gold, but again, suggesting if things aren't working on their own, step up, reevaluate, reconsider. And I think probably one of the key tips I would give uh, managing a lot of people with, with COPD is that importance of listening to what the patient says. And I would probably add two other things in here, which is number one, check they can use the inhaler they've got. And number two, check that when they have got an inhaler and they can actually use it, that they are using it. Quite a lot of patients get the prescription and leave it at home and may not be quite as compliant as we would expect. Perhaps like if you have children and you, you tell your children to do their homework, they don't always comply as you would expect them to. Our patients are very similar. They may, might not quite take the preparations we're, we're suggesting. Other quick thing from Gold and other guidance, exacerbations are important. Make sure we review patients with those, make sure we try to prevent them for the long time. And just before handing over, I think to Helgo, just think about when we're initiating inhaled corticosteroids for COPD, because Helgo's now gonna take us when we can remove them, but inhaled corticosteroids, certainly for those with a documented history of asthma, asthma needs inhaled corticosteroids is the core treatment. And that's more likely to be those who've been diagnosed properly with asthma under the age of 40. This comes from the International Primary Care Respiratory Group, great resources online if you want to look at that. The other treatment where you'd be thinking about that is someone who's been hospitalized in the past year, has a high eosinophil work count, or has had two moderate exacerbations, two oral causes of steroid during the year. And again, something we should be thinking about each time when we review our patients. So Helgo, over to you. Steve, thanks for your wonderful presentation. Um, you already said that uh, one of the most uh, important issue in uh, diagnosing patients with COPD to say this is COPD and not asthma, or this is COPD plus asthma, and this is COPD plus uh, heart failure and plus other uh, vascular problems. That is to say, we need a perfect differential diagnosis in order to be able to decide probably what kind of therapy should be used. Many years ago, I had the idea that uh, even patients with very uh, severe COPD uh, do not necessarily uh, need uh, inhaled corticosteroids. And at that time, it was very, very difficult uh, to um, get the help of the industry. And this has been done at that time uh, during Engelheim. But what this was not a formal study in terms of what we uh, see with other uh, drugs, but these were with the trial to demonstrate that ICS is not in all patients with very severe COPD a perfect solution. And in the WISDOM trial, um, we um, studied two, uh, 2,485 patients is very severe, moderate asthma. This is quite a huge number of patients. And what we did, we uh, treated these patients with teotropium, um, 80 microgram once a day, salmeterol, 50 microgram twice a day, and fluticasone propionate, 500 microgram twice a day. And then we made a stepwise withdrawal of 
uh, the um, inhaled corticosteroid over a period of 12 weeks. And after that, we observed the patients who are treated with dual bronchodilation versus those who have ICS withdrawal over um, nine uh, months, so that we have an observational time of 54 months. And what we saw is that the ICS withdrawal versus ICS continuation do not have um, statistical significant effect on um, in the primary endpoint, that is first exacerbation, the time of first exacerbation after these kind of treatment. And this was um, yeah, a wow um, observation because everybody was under the impression that inhaled corticosteroids in these patients uh, with very severe uh, COPD should be helpful. But this cohort of uh, patients were selected very carefully in that we used all the techniques to say this patient has a concomitant asthma, this patient has uh, osteoporosis, this patient has uh, allergy, and therefore we selected a patient group where we were very clear that these patients do not have a concomitant airway disease, in particular, no asthma. But we selected and separated these patients, those with moderate to severe COPD exacerbation as compared to severe COPD exacerbation. And here you see that um, ICS um, withdrawal has um, not as good effects um, as in the patient group with moderate or severe COPD. Whereas um, the, um, uh, the, the rate of relationship in those with moderate to severe COPD was only 1.06. The relationship in patients with severe COPD was uh, 1.2. And therefore, we performed a number of um, uh, um, studies um, in order to characterize why these patients Next slide. What happens? Ah, yeah. Uh, why uh, these patients may have different response to ICS uh, withdrawal? And this was the time where we all began to uh, make our research on the meaning of uh, blood eosinophil counts. And here you can see that uh, in these uh, respectable number of patients in the Wisdom study, we were able to um, um, make the uh, counts of um, blood eosinophils and we uh, could demonstrate that um, the blood eosinophils of 300 or more cells per microliter may have an effect on the um, withdrawal of inhaled corticosteroids. And those patients with more than 300 or more than 400 cells per microliter have indeed a better, worse outcome in after ICS um, withdrawal uh, than those patients where the ears and the fields had a lower level. In the meantime, many, many, many other papers uh, have been published, but uh, in essence, uh, they supported um, our first observation at that time. And uh, today, um, we can uh, summarize um, Sorry. Um, first of all, um, the, the um, new studies have been performed uh, to demonstrate that um, um, triple therapy may be even better than dual bronchodilation. And one study was the IMPACT study. And uh, in the IMPACT study, more than 10,000 patients with um, um, severe COPD were investigated. And uh, these patients received uh, three strategies. One is um, with um, 
uh, I'm Israel American. One is uh, with dual bronchodilation, and one is in Lama plus Lava plus uh, corticosteroids. And here you see that in the, in the red color, that those patients under triple therapy have the better outcomes in terms of exacerbation as compared to those with dual bronchodilation or as compared to those with bilanterol plus inhaled corticosteroid. But the method was a little, a little bit different in this study as compared to the wisdom study. And this you can hear, see here. Uh, there was uh, an abrupt risk withdrawal of ICS in these patients. And during that time, indeed, the number of exacerbation increases. But after a short time, about six weeks or so, the change in the increase of exacerbation are not different between these two uh, therapeutic regimens. This was an important observation with, uh, has also been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But then another study from uh, Klaus Rabe, and uh, Klaus Rabe is the present medical director of the lung clinic uh, in Gosansdorf. I know him very well. And uh, they performed also a very impressive study, the ATOS study. And in this study, 8,500 patients were investigated and again three therapeutic regimens combination of lama lama and uh, uh, with uh, different concentrations of inhaled corticosteroids and here this looks very similar to that what we have seen in the impact that there was a small difference between those who have inhaled corticosteroids as compared to those where no inhaled corticosteroids were um, taken by the subjects. And the difference is um, the um, odd ratio was 1.08 in the triple therapy, and it was um, 1.24 in uh, dual bronchodilation. And this is really a significant difference. But again, um, if you put these patients in the framework of um, eosinophils, on, only those patients with uh, high eosinophils do have um, a better, better results as compared to those with lower eosinophils. And then so far, And so far, we can summarize as follows. Patient with COPD receiving inhaled corticosteroid in combination with LABA or with LABA-LAMA, we can start with, first of all, do they have a documented history of asthma? This is the first decision. And if they have no documented history of asthma, then you can look whether the history of COPD exacerbation within in 12 months, the number. If the number is high, then you can think about the ICS therapy. But if the uh, history is with low exacerbation, then not necessarily you use inhaled corticosteroids. And in this case, you can consider ICS withdrawal. And here also, the importance of the number of eosinophils has been pointed out. Patients with more than 300 microliter do should con be considered as those candidates which may profit from inhaled corticosteroids. Now, um, this is another way of summarizing what, I, what we have said. Steve and myself. Um, first of all, um, we have to define what kind of exacerbation do we really have. Is it only lung function? Is this uh, symptoms? Or do we have to sample sputum in order to uh, perform cultures and uh, in order to think about uh, antibiotics? This is important. Another thing is uh, we should consider 
the oxygen saturation, which can be done uh, measured by pulse oximetry, because the pulse oximetry can also describe clinical features which are not necessarily derived from the uh, lungs, but also from the heart. And then we have to think about the management of uh, exacerbation. We have uh, explained in depth now the pharmacotherapy, and um, we have not commented on the oral corticosteroids. But in those patients, it's very severe uh, COPD, oral corticosteroids for a relatively short time, about five, five to seven days, may be good for these patients. And we have also to consider the value of antibiotics. Oxygen therapy may be also helpful, but oxygen therapy should not be prescribed in the practice. This should be done in, um, uh, in a hospital. And we have to monitor the recovery of the patient in order to see whether or not, and with, with help, they should be followed over a long period of time. Now, um, it was already mentioned Next slide, yeah. Very good. Yeah, um, that we can consider for optimizing the COPD. And if we do this, we have uh, to consider the following items. We have to characterize disease characteristics. We have to consider the socioeconomic situation of the patient. And we have to ask for his preference, what kind of therapy will he prefer and will he accept? And we have to characterize, as I said already, the physical and cognitive, cognitive limitations of the patients. Most of our therapy um, is administered by inhaler systems. And we have more than 30 different inhalers, which is a huge number. And the question is, what kind of inhaler is important for my patient? And therefore, we should know the patient. We would have the time to ask him, um, what do you like? And then we have to decide, what is the dosing frequency? What is the available drug combination? How we uh, improve the coordination when inhalation should be performed? And all of these things are very, very important. But this means it has to be done by the doctor with the patient. And from my very experience, connection to patients, for me is clear. If I prescribe an inhaler, then for the first time, then I explain the inhalation, the patient, and I show them how to inhale. And then they should do this when I be at the office. And then I ask the patient, please do this and please connect me in about, you know, yeah, connect me within the next couple of weeks and show them how your inhalation strategy is in order we can reduce the missed usage. So we can summarize this. First principle. Do not, use, do not use more than two different inhalers. Second, adapt the inhaler to the patient and not the other way around. And then periodically review the patient's inhalation technique and periodically review therapeutic compliance. And these points, from my standpoint of view, are much more important than changing inhaler. We have to explain the patient the use and not to change an inhaler. And this can be done with modern technique. We can provide patients to look in uh, interviews and we, with, and we have a lot of uh, uh, short videos where the patient can learn 
how to um, use the inhalers. And the next and last slide, you will see if you compare different inhalers, turbo inhaler, grease inhaler, the discus, genuine, and so on and so forth, the first visits, you will observe a high number of critical errors. And with the next visit and the third visit, these decreases. And this is more or less the same over all inhalers. That is to say, good inhalation means good information between the doctor and the patient, and then it works. Thank you so much. Thank Sorry, you very much, I, uh, One hot again. Sorry that um, my English is partially not good, but this is not only the English. This is, I have a very hard uh, problem with my voice, and therefore, I apologize and I hope that you understand what I would like to say to you. Thank you. Helgo, you've been magnificent. Thank you very much indeed. And I think we all appreciate your wisdom and experience in this situation. And again, I think one of the core things you were mentioning towards the end was the importance of making sure that you do teach that inhaler technique. And if you don't know how to do it, find someone who can. In some areas that may be a nurse practitioner, physician's associate, uh, a variety of clinicians, but make sure they can. So key point, we can reduce symptoms and lower the risk of disease progression and exacerbations in our patients with COPD, and we should do that. There are treatments around for tobacco dependence. There are vaccinations, which are core, fun core fundamentals, and don't forget pulmonary rehab but we have good bronchodilation and we have other therapeutic options now in terms of inhalers that should reduce that exacerbation rate down and should reduce that burden of oral corticosteroids our patients have. Don't forget to check compliance, enjoy your time with your patients and make sure we improve their quality of their life. So thank you so much for listening. I hope that's been useful. We're very happy to open this open up for question and answers now. Um, if there are any questions, we'll do our best to sort of work our way through them. Um, but probably the, the best thing to do with that is to say, also, when you get the chance, make sure you fill in the evaluation and claim your CME credits if you need those for your revalidation and certification purposes. But, but Helgo, could I just ask you, certainly one of the problems in UK practice is that a lot of patients seem to be given inhalers and no one really teaches them how to use it. There are a lot of inhaler devices around. How do we approach that nowadays? How can we get clinicians to be more engaged in ensuring our patients can actually use the inhaler? Well, first of all, the clinician should not prescribe more than two to four different inhalers. That is to say, his experience or her experience will be very solid if he restricts to a short number of inhalers. And these inhalers should be there on his office. And then he can say, this is your inhaler, and now try it, show it to me. And this is very simple, but it takes about five minutes. But these five minutes are so important that I do this since many, many, many years in every patient, um, this kind of education. Right. Um, thank you very much. One of, the, one of the things I often hear is about people who are treated with an exacerbation and their symptoms last for more than six or seven days. So you mentioned, um, I think, Gold ATS, um, NICE suggest a five-day course of oral corticosteroids and they suggest a five-day course of antibiotics if you're going to use those. But a lot of the patients I see in the UK come back and say, I'm not better yet. Should I have another course of treatment? What would your thoughts on that be? Um, exactly what you said. What we do is um, we are treating patients with oral corticosteroids over one week, let's say one week, not more. Uh, and the dose is between 20 to 40, but not more milligrams. Um, and um, antibiotics um, 
um, do we use is the CRP is higher than uh, than uh, 40. And um, uh, if it's much lower, then a bacterial infection is unlikely uh, to be responsible for the um, for the uh, bad feeling of the patient. So, so it is a question about reassuring and clinically re-evaluating if they haven't improved. I guess the other thing I sometimes see is patients who have um, things like pulmonary emboli because they've been in bed and they've got a deep vein thrombosis yeah, in addition yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. Of, so course, really... of course, of course. This is what we said, uh, Steve, uh, during this lecture now. Um, we, COPD is not only COPD. Uh, COPD is, uh, these are very severely ill persons with a number of other diseases. And you have to identify these diseases. Otherwise, you will make so many mistakes. Uh, uh, and therefore, it's not surprising that uh, some patients with COPD do very bad because we do not consider their comorbidities. Helgo, I think we're all aware of the impact of oral corticosteroids and the, the well-described documented risk with those. Yeah. And yeah. I think we are increasingly aware of high-dose inhaled corticosteroids with an increasing signal for things like pneumonia and also um, systemic effects as well. What, where do you think the role now is of an inhaled corticosteroid in our patients with CPD? Should we be moving towards that more or should we be thinking more about um, yeah, de-prescribing. Um, it is my impression that an increase in inhaled corticosteroids has a, has a very flat curve of uh, improvement. Um, and more than about a thousand microns per day uh, is not effective. And I would not do this um, because we have an, an, a number of, of papers showing that um, increasing uh, in corticosteroid rate is not just there's not a steep improvement and, and therefore yeah, yeah do not take more than thousands per day yeah so we still need to be wary about that use of an inhaled corticosteroid and and thinking about one of the things we, we spoke about a little bit earlier was the the sort of role in stable disease and safety of treatments um are there any long-term concerns about safety with the combination therapies? Not from my standpoint, no. No, and I, no. I tend not to see a great deal either. They, yes. they appear yes. to be remarkably yes. Yes. Um, safe. I think the thing that frustrates me more than anything else is sometimes the lack of the patient actually using them uh, effectively. Yeah. If, they, if they have to pay for an inhaler or they... Um, are getting an inhaler as part of our national amount mm. of money we contribute <clears throat> to um, the health of our populations. Yeah. It seems crazy to give them an inhaler they can't use. Um, but I would like, may I? Yeah. I would like to mention another point which you do not discuss. We we always talking about long acting beta agonists, but how long uh, these action is really? Uh, it is 12 hours or it is 24 hours and uh, it is really a good idea to inhale once per day or it's much better to inhale twice per day. And we have done a number of studies on this and um, we performed um, or we followed up FEP1 over a period of one day every two hours also during night. And there you see that a long acting um, uh, teotropin, for example, will have the peak at about six to eight hours. And then it declines overnight. And 24 hours later, nothing is there. Nothing is there. This back to the back room, to the, to the, to the first generation. And if you take uh, another drug, acridinium, for example, um, and you give them twice a day, early in the morning and eight or 10 o'clock in the evening, then you will see also a decrease of FEV1 overnight. But after inhalation, 
of the second dose, there's an increase in FFV1 so that early in the morning, the starting point of FFV1 after two times inhalation of so-called long acting beta agonists is much better as compared to those if it's only inhaled um, once. So, About so really years ago, we started with a long, with a huge number of studies with Augusti on Peter Carly and so on, and we have more or less all the same conclusion. And so, um, so what we probably need to do, Helgo, is make sure we understand the pharmacological aspects of the drugs we're using and their half lives, and make sure we do that effectively. Exactly. And, and so just in conclusion, thank you all for listening to this um, presentation. I hope you found it useful. It's been great having Helgo with me um, on the presentation. And I hope you've gained some enthusiasm to make a real difference to our patients out there with COPD, because we can make a difference in our own countries and globally. And we're on that track now, and we're using information from all over the place to make things better. Thank you very much for taking part in this and for your questions.